On this warm August Sunday in 1991, Francis Thompson isn't expecting any company. Then Dean Frank shows up. Although a so-called friend to Francis, he's been making threatening phone calls and she is frightened. Francis fears for her life. She grabs a loaded gun, not sure what Dean is capable of. And he threatened her. It was something to the effect of, I'm going to kill you. And at that point, he charged at her. The whole situation escalates from zero to a hundred in the blink of an eye. Anytime there's a death in a small community, it shakes the community up. capital of Lincoln, Nebraska, is the small village of Verdigree. It's a population of about 500, a lot of nice people. Verdigree boasts a high Czech population, and as the Kalachi capital of the world, embraces its Czech origins by hosting a festival every June to celebrate the fruity Kalachi pastry. Located in Knox County, Verdigree is an agricultural-based economy, with 86% of the county's land used as farmland and roughly 1,200 farms in the county. We have a lot of tourism because of the river and the state parks and the, the wildlife. A lot of out-of-state hunters come up here. We're one of the premier duck hunting areas in the nation. In 1985, Although not farmers, Frances Thompson and her teenage son move on to a farmstead 20 miles north of Verdigree after her husband dies in a construction accident. It's a chance for them to start over. She was the type of person that maybe wasn't what you would say ordinary to our community. A little bit different, but uh, nothing criminal-wise about her that I had ever known. Frances meets Dean Frank a man a few years her senior who used to farm and is now living in Atkinson, about an hour away. Dean was hardworking. He was a, a bohemian. He had farmed nearby until the farm crisis in the early 80s. Like a lot of farmers, when the farm crisis hit, he had difficulties. Francis pays Dean to come by and do odd jobs around the farm. And on occasions where he works into the evening, he stays overnight in a spare bedroom upstairs. He and Francis develop a close friendship. Francis is an avid animal rights activist and an environmentalist. In the summer of 1987, she purchases a pig. She names it Arthur. If she could rescue every animal destined for slaughter, she would, and so begins her dream of converting the property into an organic farm. She was, I guess you would say, an animal rights activist in a small way, at least, in her mind. In the summer of 1988, Francis attends the university in Lincoln, Nebraska, studying environmental law. Dean's main task becomes the care and well-being of Arthur, Francis's pet pig, while she's away. By 1991, Francis is in her third year of studying environmental law at Lincoln. She's a straight-A student, passionate about animal rights and environmental protection. 
And while she may be older than a lot of the students in her classes, this is the life transformation Francis is looking for after the death of her husband. Francis' son is now grown and away from the farm, attending the Naval Academy. That summer, after classes finish and Francis returns from Lincoln University, her relationship with Dean takes a romantic turn. They had a non-sexual friendship, occasional odd job employer relationship, and that continued up until basically the summer of his death, 1991. On June 16th, Francis spends the night in Dean's trailer. This is when Dean first suggests the idea of marriage, positioning it at first as a business venture. She said that he grew interested in having a sexual relationship with her and talked about marriage, that he would quit his job and work on the farm with her and that they could uh, do organic farming, which was coming into vogue back in that period of time and what she would have had an interest in. According to Frances, Dean puts this to her in almost like a business type of proposal. He suggests to her that she has a farm, but she's not a farmer, whereas he's a farmer without a farm. Needless to say, she wasn't interested in that. And this upset him, of course, according to Fran. Frances is also an avid letter writer. Nine days later, she writes to Dean telling him about a test that she took at the University Health Center to get a certificate of sexual health. In another letter where she invites Dean to her son's graduation, she also writes, I put way too much energy into agonizing over letting sex back into my life. Guess it ain't for you, but for me, it was the biggest change in lifestyle imaginable. Though Frances downplays her romantic interest in Dean and says that she never took his proposal seriously, her actions and her letters suggest there is something romantic, or at least sexual, between her and Dean. She insisted that they would get tested by a doctor before there would be any sexual contact. On July 3rd, Dean visits Frances in Lincoln and stays with her at her duplex for six days. Dean and Francis leave Lincoln together and return to Verdigree, where they both see a physician and get tested for AIDS and syphilis. Francis is concerned because Dean has had other sexual partners, whereas Francis, since her husband passed, has not. She also would write letters saying that she was very much of two minds about whether or not to resume a sexual relationship with a man. On July 12th, Francis drives to Atkinson to deliver the results of the test to Dean in person. Francis opens the envelope and finds that the tests were negative, so neither of them have a sexually transmitted infection. Any apprehension Francis had regarding starting an intimate relationship with Dean should be alleviated at this point. But she's still nervous. However, she's starting to develop feelings and ultimately spends four days with Dean at this point. The next week, Frances returns to visit Dean. She has something on her chest she needs to get off. In my investigation, she had alleged she had been in an abusive relationship in the Omaha metro area before she moved out here. That was probably part of the reason why she backgrounded Dean Frank. Frances lets Dean know that she wants to meet his ex-wife. Dean's not terribly happy about the idea of Francis poking around in his background, uh, and he pretty much shuts the idea down right away. Francis is troubled by Dean's response. It makes her suspicious. Perhaps Dean is hiding something. Soon after that visit, Dean calls Francis to divulge episodes from his past. He shares with her about his former lovers. His motive for doing this is not entirely clear. I think Dean felt bad about the way he reacted to the idea of meeting with the ex-wife, and this was a way for him to try to build trust. But I think Francis took it as a way of trying to make her jealous. 
perhaps in an attempt to make her more open to the idea of a sexual relationship a little sooner than she would have otherwise been. By July 24th, Francis suspects that Dean's interest in her is not without strings attached. Francis writes a letter to her son who's away at the Naval Academy, and she tells him that she thinks Dean is just trying to use her to get to the farm. She was saying really derogatory things about Dean. She would call him a houseboy or a dog. She made fun of his physical appearance and stuff like that. And she would say that she was leading him on or letting him think that there was a possibility that they were going to get married. At the end of the letter, she signs off saying, Remember, I may whine and cry, but I is a tough old lady and a damn good shot too. On August 6th, Francis goes to a hardware store in Verdigree. She had come into the store and bought 357 ammo for her revolver. Fran had a couple guns, a Beretta 25 Auto and a Colt 357 Magnum revolver. She also asks about the materials necessary for building a door brace. Francis purchases the shells and returns home. Later that day, Francis writes a letter to a friend in Omaha, expressing her dislike for an ex of Dean's named Dolores, who she says still cares about Dean. She refers to Dean in her letter as a classic sociopath and false friend. Francis sent a letter to one of Dean's exes, Dolores, expressing that she had spent the night with Dean on June 16th. She makes a comment in the letter about the fact that she didn't in fact sleep with Dean on that night, which is a strange tactic if she's trying to make Dolores jealous. Francis basically tries to play it off as Dean was her persistent admirer, she didn't reciprocate. There are letters from Francis to Dean talking about uh, bringing sex back into her life, talking about uh, STI tests that she took. Uh, So these letters are certainly indicative that Francis was more than an uninterested party. These directly contradict her, and they are evidence that can be used in court. Tensions in the relationship between Francis Thompson and Dean Frank are building, and are about to take a violent turn. Located roughly 20 miles northwest of the small village of Verdigree, Nebraska, is a farm. The widowed Frances Thompson sees it as a chance for her and her son to start over. As part of turning her life around, Frances pursued her passion for environmentalism and animal rights. So she enrolled in the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. She was a very high-achieving student there. In the summer of 1991, after Frances finishes her third year studying environmental law, and while her son is away at the Naval Academy, a romance between her and longtime friend Dean Frank begins to blossom. But over the course of the summer, that romance turns sour. On August 17th, Francis calls the sheriff's office to report threatening calls from Dean Frank. When asked if she needs assistance, she says no. She wanted to lodge a complaint against Dean Frank. It was kind of a strange request in a way because she was very calm, very matter of fact, no excitement, no fear, just wanted to lodge a complaint. On August 18th, Francis is at her computer typing up incident reports from Dean's threatening phone calls. She's startled from her work when she hears a car door slam outside. She's not expecting anybody, and she worries it might be Dean. She creeps to the window and peeks out from behind the blind. She sees Dean has arrived, unannounced. According to Francis, the last time she spoke with Dean, he threatened her. So she grabs her gun, checks that it's loaded, and makes sure to keep it close by, just in case.
There's tension in the air as Dean makes his way to the kitchen to put away the groceries. Frances claims that she never asked him to come over, but now she's too afraid to ask him to leave. The whole situation escalates from zero to a hundred in the blink of an eye. Prior to the confrontation on August 18th, Frances had obtained some ammunition for her 357 Magnum. The fact that she armed herself with the most powerful firearm of those that she had was certainly telling. So at any point before the homicide happened, she practiced with both handguns. There was evidence to indicate that. Frances was a security guard at one point, and she's developed a proficiency for the use of these firearms as a result of her experience. There is a record of Frances talking to the sheriff and advising the sheriff that Dean's threats have been escalating and that she is receiving threatening calls from him. The sheriff advises Frances to keep a record of these calls and also advises her that she should attend court and get a restraining order against him. However, it's a Sunday, so she'll have to wait until the next business day. So generally, you would have to apply for a restraining order at the courthouse. Normally, they want documentation that there's threats being made of some sort and that you do feel that you're in danger. Dean enters the house and goes straight to the kitchen to unload groceries. What happens next will change their lives forever. Her story was that he came in, he lunged at her and said, I'm going to kill you or something to that effect. According to Francis, she draws the gun and warns Dean to stop. When he does it, she fires three shots and fires the three remaining shots into the floor. Francis calls the sheriff's office at 5.35 p.m. from the farmhouse, advising them that she shot someone in self-defense. She said, I want to speak to a deputy. I shot Dean Frank. He came into my house. At 6.25 p.m., almost an hour after the call is placed, authorities arrive on the scene where they're admitted to the home by Francis. They responded as quick as they could, but it took 50 minutes to get there from the time she called. When I entered the house, I seen no signs of a forced entry. I didn't see any signs of a struggle inside, which I thought was kind of strange. Everything appeared to be like it should be. The sheriff is surprised to see Dean still alive. He's bleeding out badly and is minutes from death. The deputy attempts to stymie the bleeding while the sheriff calls for paramedics. He was still alive at that particular time. and They treated his wounds that they saw and then tried to stabilize him. He basically was dead the minutes after the EMTs arrived. The sheriff informs Frances she'll need to come in for questioning, but she insists that she was only defending herself and points to the self-defense message Dean wrote in his blood as proof. Soon, the forensics expert arrives to assist the investigation. The message written in blood still has the sheriff puzzled when he notices a nearby suitcase, where he discovers a series of notes. If investigators hope to get any answers, they'll have to question their only witness. asks Francis to detail for him the events that led up to the shooting. Francis recounts that on August 17th, she calls for the first time to report that she's receiving threatening phone calls from Dean. She tells him that that very morning, she reports more threatening calls from Dean to the deputy, with instructions to get a restraining order the following day. She tells the sheriff she wasn't expecting Dean to show up that day, but she wasn't entirely surprised that he did. She expected a confrontation would occur at some point, and that's why she had her gun ready with her. Frances claims the gun is only by her side for protection in case Dean makes any threats. 
the sheriff asks Francis if there's anything that provokes Dean, or if there's any struggle at all. She tells him that the door is unlocked when Dean lets himself in without a word. He goes to the kitchen to put some things in the fridge, and without warning, he turns and shouts, I'm going to kill you. She doesn't expect him to keep advancing after she draws the gun and warns him to stop. Frances claims that she can't actually remember Dean's exact wording, but she's pretty certain he issued a threat. She says this isn't the first time he's given her cause to fear for her life. On July 28th, there's another phone call from Dean to Frances, and she indicates that this is him again trying to convince her to marry him. She turns down his offer like she did before, and this is basically when things get ugly. She says at this point he tells her that if I can't have you, then no one will. She interpreted that as a threat to kill her. In the summer of 1991, the friendship between Frances Thompson and Dean Frank takes a romantic turn. And on June 16th, Dean suggests the idea of marriage, positioning it at first as a business venture. Frances turns down Dean's proposal. She claims that Dean begins making threatening phone calls to her. With the increased threats and fearing for her safety, she buys ammo for her 357 Magnum and sharpens her shooting skills. Frances alleges that she shoots Dean three times as he charges her. She says she fires in quick succession and after seeing he's been hit, fires the last three bullets into the floor. She gets a pillow to put under Dean's head and calls it in. She reloads her gun and keeps an eye on Dean. Francis claims that after Dean was shot that he was crawling along the floor and blood splatter experts reveal that there was no indication of such an accusation. In fact, blood was contained to that one area in the home. In addition to investigators obtaining Francis's gun, they also took her computer as evidence. The sheriff and deputy discuss what they've uncovered so far in their investigation and compare it with Francis's testimony. The fact that Dean is found in her home after multiple alleged threatening phone calls helps her plea of self-defense. Yet there are no signs of forced entry. And according to Francis, no struggle. Just Dean's alleged threat and his motion towards her. Is it enough to warrant deadly force? The sheriff reviews the printout from Francis's computer that she was working on at the time Dean came to the house. It's the assault report that he instructed her to make. But the inconsistencies in her testimony when compared with the actual evidence are causing him to wonder if this is truly a case of self-defense or whether this is premeditated and made to look like self-defense. Francis claims that the threatening phone calls continue and get to the point where she calls the sheriff's office to report Dean on August 17th. 
she's instructed to keep a record of all future phone calls from Dean. It was kind of abnormal almost because she wasn't excited, she wasn't scared. It was like she was making a record is all she wanted to do. There are phone records of the calls between Dean and Francis. Some of them revealed the calls were only 10 minutes long, while others were as long as two hours. What is discussed on these calls is impossible to know for sure. But according to Francis, Dean was insistent on marrying her and wouldn't drop it, becoming more unhinged and more threatening each time she refused him. Investigators review the evidence in conjunction with Francis' testimony. Her account of him is a person obsessed with her and frustrated that he can't have her. Well, they do only have Francis's version of events to go on, but she has records of all the dates and times of these alleged threats, so that can help her case. The sheriff reviews Francis's assault report with her in an effort to understand her history with Dean and what led to the use of deadly force. Francis is cooperative in explaining that the calls became increasingly threatening, and she adds that on August 5th, she speaks to Dolores Fisher, Dean's ex-girlfriend who lives in Atkinson. Francis says that Dolores tells her that once when he was drunk, Dean threatened to slit her throat. Well, after the conversation with Dean's ex, Francis makes the decision that there's no way she could possibly pursue a relationship with him. A few days after her call with Dean's ex, Francis finds Dean on the property fixing Arthur the Pig's irrigation pipe. It's at this time that Francis allegedly tells Dean to never come back to her farm. She claims he writes out a note that gives Francis all of the property that he was storing on the farm, including a 1973 Ford pickup truck. The document and the title are found in Francis's kitchen following Dean's death. Investigators review Francis's call logs against the phone records from her and Dean's phones. The calls on August 17th and 18th correspond with the records. The deputy also recalls Francis inquiring on how to get a restraining order, calling Dean a dangerous psycho and saying how scared she was of him. Well, Dean didn't really have any assets. Anything he had on the farm, he allegedly gave to Francis. So investigators aren't seeing any motive for Dean to kill Francis at this point. What they are seeing is that Dean was a threat and that Francis feared for her life. Frank dies from his wounds and Francis claims it was self-defense. But the autopsy report is about to reveal to investigators a very different story from the one Francis has been telling. Now, the autopsy, to me, was interesting because there was one entrance wound from the front going out the back, and there were two entrance wounds in the back of the body, which he'd have been turned away from her. One did not exit, was lodged actually in his hip. The other totally blew his liver apart, exited the front of his body, and hit his right elbow. The pathologist at the time had remarked, you could have shot this guy right outside the emergency room door and took him in the emergency room. He would not have survived five to seven minutes. I said, Doc, it took 50 minutes from the time we got that call to the time the deputies got to the scene and went in the house, and he was still alive. And the doctor said, that's impossible. There's no way this guy was alive 50 minutes after being shot. Well, investigators put together a timeline of the events. And according to the sheriff's log, they received a call about the shooting at 5.35 p.m. Police arrived about 6.25 p.m. By 6.30, they had determined that he had no pulse or other vital signs. And at 7 p.m., he was pronounced dead after CPR proved unsuccessful. So Francis's accounts of the events is not what the evidence and the autopsy are from the medical examiner's findings. Forensic pathologists would be doing an autopsy, and ultimately the only two people that know what occur at a scene are the victim and the suspect. Now Dean is deceased, 
and so the autopsy proves that he actually sustained three gunshot wounds, but not all simultaneously as Francis had first indicated. The autopsy reveals that Dean sustained a gunshot wound that actually gave a laceration to his liver and would only give him about 15 minutes to live due to the fact it was so vascular and bleeding. And yet Francis made a 911 call at about 5.30 in the evening and when the resources and 911 showed up at the house, he was still alive at 6.30. So that would have been an hour. So there are definitely conflicts with her first story to what the body is saying. Francis first reveals that all three gunshot wounds happen simultaneously, but the autopsy indicates otherwise. That type of wound and the evidence that the medical examiner found are consistent with those not being gunshot wounds that the victim received an hour prior. Frances Thompson claims she shot Dean Frank in self-defense. The forensics report tells a different story. Was this a murder? On August 18th, 1991, Frances Thompson shoots Dean Frank. She claims self-defense, but the forensics report contradicts her claim. After reviewing the sheriff's investigation and the autopsy report, the district attorney's office decides to try Francis for first-degree murder and instructs the sheriff to place her under arrest. The community is shocked to find out that animal-loving environmentalist Francis Thompson is being charged with first-degree murder. Her defense team is hopeful that they can use her history and standing in the community to paint a sympathetic view. Their defense is going to be self-defense, that Dean was going to assault her and she shot in self-defense. They set out to paint a picture of Dean as dangerous, an unhinged man with a history of threatening behavior. They enter into evidence letters Francis writes describing her fear of Dean, and his increasingly threatening phone calls. They attempt to dissuade the jury of any notion that Francis is jealous and wants to keep Dean. In a letter where Francis alludes to being jealous and in love with Dean, the defense claims that Francis only means that she loves him as a friend. And when she says jealous, what she really means is disgusted. They paint Dean as the one who is obsessed with Francis and claim that she had no romantic interest in him whatsoever, which is why he threatens to kill her, and ultimately why she has the right to defend herself. The defense is trying to argue that Francis and Dean's relationship was one-sided and that Dean was the pursuer of Francis and that she was disinterested. However, the letters from Francis to Dean paint a very different picture. They talk about how she's in love with him, how she's jealous of his ex-partners, and they also talk about the sexual health tests that they got. So not only did Francis tell Dean that on June 25th she received a negative test, they also go together to a doctor on July 9th and get tested for AIDS and syphilis, and she then goes to hand deliver the negative results to him. So all of this paints a very different picture than the picture that the defense is trying to paint. The prosecution brings up Sharon Boehm as a witness. Francis claims Boehm told her of several incidences of Dean beating his ex-wife. However, Boehm testifies that she told Francis she heard of one incident, which she refers to as hearsay, in which Frank shoves his ex-wife. But she did not say that Dean was violent in any way. And then the other girlfriend that she talked to also did not say that Dean was ever violent in any way. Both testify that he becomes verbally abusive only when he's drinking. The medical examiner explains to the jury that at the time of the autopsy, Dean's blood alcohol content is 0 .000. So that indicates that he had not consumed any alcohol prior to his alleged altercation with Francis. The expert witness further reveals that Dean is only shot once in the front, 
The other two entry wounds are in his back while he's lying face down. She further explains that the fatal gunshot could not have been at 5.35 when Francis reports the shooting, as there is no way Dean could have survived that long. The fatal gunshot occurs sometime after Dean is initially shot and on the floor. The forensics expert points out the absurdity of Francis' statement that Dean willingly wrote self-defense in his own blood. Lastly, the prosecution demonstrates that this is not a self-defense case, but that this murder was in fact premeditated. They show the gun Francis used to kill Dean, as well as the smaller caliber pistol she had, and the two bottles of mace found nearby, all of which could have been used to defend herself. The fact that she armed herself with the most powerful firearm of those that she had was certainly telling. Based on the evidence, the prosecution describes a very different version of the events on the day Dean Frank was killed. They tell the jury that Dean arrives at Francis' farmhouse, is let in by Francis who then watches and waits while Dean puts groceries in the fridge. Francis calls Dean over to look at something on the computer. Dean turns to face her and takes a few steps forward when Francis pulls the gun and shoots him. Dean is lying there bleeding out and Francis walks up and point blank shoots him in the back. She had called in and said she had shot him and he's not dying. It's not like TV, you don't just shoot somebody and they die. It takes a while. Written in blood on the floor next to Dean where he's laying, self-defense, and his blood printed on the floor. Francis reloads her gun and waits for the sheriff to arrive. All I can make out at the time was the word self was wrote in blood on the floor, and there was some hand-scribbled type messages on paper. Something to the effect of self-defense, or it was very poorly spelled, hard to read, but uh, something to the effect of self-defense, I love you, Fran, things like that. Who wrote these notes? We may never know. I did observe some blood on his right fingertip, I think, on maybe two fingers, so... Did he write him himself? Did he get help write him? Did he write him under duress, being told to, or else more bad things are going to happen? Most likely the last is, the, is what happened. You've been shot, you're laying there, and somebody tells you write something, you're probably going to write it. From the time Fran Thompson called the sheriff's office until the deputies arrived, it was approximately 50 minutes before they went in the front door. The fatal shot that came in the back Blew a party's liver, exited up front, was shot five to seven minutes prior to the deputies going in the door. What it tells me is he wasn't shot with that fatal shot prior to her making a phone call like she said. The prosecution shows jurors that with a gun as powerful as the Magnum, there's an immense amount of recoil. Meaning Francis doesn't just fire off all six shots in quick succession like she claims. The shots are spaced allowing time to aim between each round. The prosecution, in their closing argument, tries to point the jury to Francis' post-defense conduct or lack of conduct, and that Francis is trained in Red Cross first aid. However, she didn't do anything to try to save Dean's life. What can actually be drawn from this may not be that meaningful. There could be a lot of reasons why Francis didn't try to save him. She could have been in shock, for example. However, the prosecution is asking the jury to use this to infer her guilt. The jury goes away to deliberate Francis's fate. Jury members must decide if Francis Thompson is guilty of first degree murder. Francis is an animal lover, an environmentalist, a straight-A student, a loving mother, and at one point, a friend of the victim. 
There isn't a strong motive for why she would have premeditated to kill Dean Frank. But the jurors must review the evidence. And the evidence shows that she bought high caliber rounds for a powerful revolver. She target practiced with both of her guns. She left the door unlocked even though she claims to be afraid of Dean. And there are no signs of attack or struggle. Hence, no motivator for her to shoot him. Francis is trying to argue that she shot Dean in self-defense and also trying to say that he then wrote self-defense in his own blood. The jurors certainly don't buy that, and they're also concerned because Dean was shot twice in the back when he was already down, at which point she wouldn't have really been in fear of him. Jurors return after deliberating, and the judge asks the foreperson if they've reached a unanimous verdict. Frances looks on nervously, her fate hanging in the balance. The foreperson rises and informs the judge that they have reached a verdict. The verdict was that she was guilty of the homicide. Frances is devastated. Murmurs erupt throughout the courtroom and the judge calls for silence. He sentences Frances to life imprisonment for first degree murder and 10 years imprisonment for the firearm charge. The sentences to run consecutively. Anytime there's a death in a small community, it shakes the community up. In this case, a person that moved through the community murdered a person born and raised in the community. And of course, that rocks people too. You know, somebody you see every day, now they're dead, now they're murdered. A person that they were with a lot is accused of that murder. In a small community, it's, it's, it's hard. In the end... The questions of how and why it escalated to this point go unanswered. The case puzzles people in the community. They struggle to find a motive for why Francis killed Dean Frank. And they struggle with the tragedy that someone with so much potential is now serving life in prison. But life goes on in Knox County. People have been farming the land here for centuries. It's a way of life that passes down from one generation to the next. The process of planting, growing, and harvesting. It's a simple and beautiful process amidst a sometimes chaotic and ugly world. <laughs>